But I want to continue the series of being seen, right? Being seen. And I want to talk to you today <clears throat> about this. How do you see Jesus? How do you see Jesus? And when we look at it on this day, Mother's Day, I, I was thinking about it, and, and I just thought about moms, how special they are, and how unique they are. And my mom, you know, she was my dad and my mother, because my father passed when I was three months old, and so she was both sides. So she could be love and judgment, you know, grace and switch or belt or whatever's in her hand at the time. And uh, she uh, she was an amazing woman. I remember she would ask me some questions. Anybody ever get those certain questions? I know the boys get it from Steph. You get those questions like this, where have you been? And you're thinking, oh, you're, you're rolling it, your mind's going, where have you been? They only ask this why in two situations. They know where you've been or they know where you might go that you don't need to go, right? Another good question is that mom asked, uh, do you really want to do that, son? <laughs> you know, you're like, a, do I really want to do that? Let me see. Does she know? She only says that when I'm getting ready to do something stupid, so maybe I need to think that through. Or finally, this one got me in trouble several times. What did you say to me? Uh, nothing, Mom. I heard you say something. Come here. And uh, so we all we all know those stories, right? But as we as we just kind of get going today, I want to talk to you just a minute about being seen and how do we see Jesus. And when we are on a day like this and we're honoring our mothers and we're honoring those that that are in our life that even are your mother may be gone or all. Heaven, or maybe you never knew your mother, but you have someone in your life that plays that role. And it's so important that they feel seen. I mean, think about it. That was so strong on Pastor Seth's heart with Becky, and it was so true that so many times we don't feel seen, especially moms, because moms seem to be doing everything all the time. And that's one of the things I talked to her brother about because, he, like I say, they have the one son at home right now who who's graduating this year, and I just said, man, you're going to have to be, you know, not just dad, you're going to be mom and dad as much as you can be because he's craving that, he's going to be craving that side and missing that side. And I know there's so many things that the boys know who to go to for certain things and who to go to for other things, and, and you know, together we just kind of balance things out. And I know how difficult it is for you that are single parents as well. Can you turn my monitor down just a little bit? Uh, how it is a single parents too, because you can, you know, you got to play both sides, work both sides. And, and it's so important that we understand that. And I, I told Jonathan, man, you, you know, it's, it's going to be a little different. And I saw him that week while we were there, just trying to do that other side. And for men, it's hard, right? Men, it's hard for us to play the role of a mom. For men, it's difficult for us to kind of show that vulnerable side. You can turn down some more of the monitor. To show that vulnerable side, to show that sense of side. But that's why God is God. He is both, the Bible says, male and female, right? And so he is one, and we are offshoots of that. And what happens, guys, is, is that we all crave these certain types of personalities and so on. So as we think about it, just think about the moms here that maybe you don't feel seen. Maybe you're so busy, you're doing so much all the time, it seems as though it's not appreciated. And what I've found is this, doing this thing for now, well, over 30 years, 35, 36 years, and that is so many times when people do pass away, they never get a glimpse of how much they're really seen, how much they're really appreciated, how much they're really loved. And I don't want you to be that person, whether you're a mom or a dad or a son or a daughter here today. Just remember that you were born for such a time as this and that you are important and God doesn't make junk. And he needs you to be an influence wherever you're at. Does anyone believe that this morning? So I want to look at two different perspectives of how two sisters saw Jesus. Because the, how you see Jesus is going to depend on your happiness. How you see Jesus is going to depend on can you live in peace in time of turmoil. How you see Jesus is, is what's going to be there to calm you when the storms of life hit. How you see Jesus is going to determine how you handle yourself with your loved ones, with your family, with your friends. So how do we truly see Jesus? And there's different ways that we can see him and definitely different perspectives, but I want to talk to you about two sisters right now. Turn with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 10. 
Luke chapter 10. I'm just going to read a few verses, beginning in verse 38. And here's what it says. It says, As Jesus and his disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into their home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he had taught. But Martha was distracted. Everybody say distracted. By the big dinner she was preparing. She came, she came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister sits here while I'll do all the work? Tell her to come and to help me. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset about many details. There is only one thing, everybody say one thing, only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it and it will not be taken away from her. Now, these two sisters have two totally different perspectives of the way they see Jesus because the way I see Jesus is the way I receive from Jesus. I said the way I see Jesus is the way I receive Jesus. I know you, many of you have heard my story, and it's actually after my mother passed away and the economy crashed and all this stuff in 07 and going, going on. And I didn't realize it, but I fell into some type of depression. And I'm not a person that is easily depressed or never knew what it was, really, for several years. And finally, Pastor Steph just kept seeing me go down, down, down. I mean, I'd come to work, work every how I many hours and days and do whatever I had to do, preach and all that. I just stopped any hobbies, golf or anything. It was kind of like you know, church and work, home, church and work home, church and preach, home, church and preach, home. And that was my life for about two and a half, three years, just just slowly seeing the energy come out of me, not, not having the emotions that I used to have, even with my family. And she said, honey, something something's going on. And I'm like, well, yeah, obviously. And we had a really good talk about it. And we're just such people of faith. We lay hands on people, see things happen. But actually what I had to do was, I had to go to who now is one of one of my top mentors in my life, Dr. John Walker, to, to get counseling. And I'd never done anything like that. I thought, man, this is this is not me. And I flew to Colorado, and I'll never forget when I was flying to Colorado to spend a week at his place with he and his wife. And he counseled some of the most largest ministries and smaller ministries in the nation. And uh, and so as I'm starting to land on the plane, we're starting to land in Colorado and Denver. Um, and it's like, I just started crying. And I'm like, why am I crying? And the reason I was crying was because I felt in my heart, what if he can't help me? I prayed. I fasted. I've taken retreats. <laughs> I've had people around me, family around me. All these things are going on. And, and then I felt hopeless. I felt hopeless. But when I got there, within about four hours, he started ministering to me. And by the next day, I was just about free. And by the end of the week, I was totally free. And he helped me discover something about myself that's really critical that I hadn't seen. You see, it's easy when we're looking at other people to see them the way we perceive them. That's not always right because you don't know what it costs to be someone else and neither do I, right? But, but we see them and we perceive we know. Right, We understand, and that determines how you treat them, how you receive them, and how you hang with them or don't hang with them. And, and, and what I realized was my issue wasn't the economy. My issue wasn't that I was upset and angry because my mother passed away. My issue wasn't those things. Those were just effects of it. Listen to me now. My issue was the way I saw Jesus. Wait, 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 Pastor, at that time, and this is about 2011 maybe or something like that, 10 or 11. So that was 12 years ago. So at that time, I'd already been preaching since, what, I was 23. So ever how long? That was, that, was, that was a day or two ago. So I'd already been a pastor and full-time ministry over 20 years at the time. And do you mean I didn't see Jesus correctly? Hmm. It didn't start that way. Fell in love with him, crazy about him. Could there was nothing else but him, but just so transformational and deliverance and all this stuff and helping people and loving people and doing all these things. But I didn't see Jesus maybe as Mary did. I had more Martha's perspective. I had that performance perspective. If I 
don't sin, if I'm good enough, and if I don't mess up, and if I work hard, and if the church grows, and if more people get saved, and more people get baptized, and we feed more people, and we help more people, and we clothe more people, and I just put more time in and more time in, then he's going to love me more and more. He's going to see me more and more. I didn't realize that I was living in this performance trap with Abba, with Daddy, with Heavenly Father, with the one that the Bible says what first loved me. I didn't get that. I thought, oh yeah, he loved me and he gave his life for me. Now it's on me. He did that for me. Now I got to pay him back. Now I didn't verbalize it. I didn't speak it out loud, but I was living my life like it was payback. Like, like God, you know, I'd be in hell if it wasn't for you already. I'd already be gone. It's payback. But see, he didn't purchase you to pay you back. He purchased you to release you to be who he called you to be. He, he, he didn't bring you out of the snare of addiction in hell just to use you as a tool. He brought you in as a son, as a dog. Not a neighbor, not a friend, not a worker, but as a son or a daughter. And as I think about that, and when it really got to me that I just did not see him as father, I saw him as Lord, right? He is Lord. He is King of kings and Lord of all. I, I, I saw him as God, the heavenly father, the great I am. I saw him as Savior, the Savior of the world and my Savior. I saw him as provider, healer, deliverer. But the most important thing I didn't see him as was daddy. And the Bible says that he suffered or loved little children, right? And little children would come to him. And, and when Jesus would pray to his father, many times he would say, Abba, Father. What does that mean? Abba in, in, in the, the, not Latin, but in the uh, Aramaic that he spoke meant daddy, daddy. He'd say, daddy, daddy. Now think about that for, for a second. Maybe you're a mom right now and you feel like you're just working all the time. Maybe you're a mom right now and you feel like you're all alone. Maybe you are all alone. Maybe you're by yourself. Maybe you're in a house with a husband and a bunch of kids and you still feel alone. Or maybe you're doing pretty good and it's easy if you're not careful to get distracted and miss the most important thing. So whatever situation you're in, mom, whatever situation you're in, dad, or whoever I'm speaking to today is, we got to realize that we're not in this to perform. We're in this to love. What? Your mission is what? It's not to do, it's to love. Now, if you love someone, you'll do things, right? What do you say? The greatest commandment is what? Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and what? Love your neighbor as yourself. Wait a minute. I had that love God doing the best I could do, love God with all my heart. I had that, well, I need to love my neighbor. I'll sacrifice, I'll study, I'll, I'll go hand out to the home, I'll do whatever I got. I had that doing loving my neighbor, the as part. I don't know if I really love myself until I learned that God loved me just as I am, not as I should be. Where do you think that came from? Just the cool quote we picked up somewhere? That's what saved my life. God loves me not as I should be, or as I think I should be, or anyone else thinks I should be, but God loves me, what? Just as I am. Thank you for that. I was getting ready to do that. What? Loves me, what? As I am. So it's not about performance, it's about being. It's not even about submitting. He loved you before you were submitted. He loved you before you came to him. He died for you and rose him for you. And I think of moms and I think of their sacrifice. I think of how my mom would sacrifice and work and do all these things. And I see how Steph sacrifices for me and how she sacrifices for the boys and, and all those things and how you other moms do it. But remember, you're not just doing it because it's an obligation. We're doing it because it's a flow of love. And if we don't see Jesus correctly, we can't love our family correctly. If we don't see Jesus correctly, we can't love our friends correctly. And if we don't see Jesus correctly, we cannot love ourselves correctly. But Dr. Walker, my friend, now gave me some tools 
that I don't use them that often now, but I used them for the first two or three years a lot. And it was, I came up with this acronym, STP, Stop, Think, Pray. Stop, Think, Pray. And I had a little system I used and, and how I, I don't want to get into all that. But anyway, it, it was cool for me and other things he gave me and, and so on. But what I'm saying is he helped me in my time of need, but he didn't free me. Jesus freed me, right? What he did was redirect me to the center of love and to who daddy is. And once I met my father, it changed everything. Can you say change everything? So let's look real quickly at these two perspectives. I probably jumped ahead a little bit. And as I read that to you about Martha's perspective and Mary's, and how do they see Jesus? How do you see Jesus is what I want to ask you today. How do you really see him? Is he the boss? Is he that God out there? Is he this Lord? Is he this taskmaster? Or is he the Easter Bunny? I don't know. How do you see Jesus? These sisters saw him totally different. First, let's look at Martha. Let's look at Martha's perspective of how she saw Jesus. Now, what's interesting, if you we read that again, the very first verse up there, verse 38, it says that she was the one that first received Jesus into their home. It wasn't Lazarus, the head of the family, who was later raised from the dead, being a close friend of Jesus. It, it wasn't Mary, the spiritual one, the deep one, the worship one, that invited Jesus. It was Martha, the one that had the gifts and the serving and, and get the, the get-her-done woman. That's the one that invited Jesus into their home. So our greatest strengths can be our greatest weaknesses, but they're also still our greatest strengths. And as we look at that, we begin to think about it. Her serving hands, her hospitality is what brought Jesus into the life of her brother brought Jesus into the life of her sister Mary, and definitely is what brought Jesus into her home. But what Jesus was getting to in those few passages was, it's cool you're, you have this gift of hospitality, Martha, but I'm not after your hospitality, I'm after your heart. You see, the key to understanding who Abba is, who Jesus is, what is it? It, it is not our works, it's our heart. And God wants our heart. He wants our honesty. He wants our transparency. But he transparency, but he wants our heart. Everybody say, God wants my heart. Hmm. Is this helping anybody? So as we look again in verse 39 and 40, it says, her sister Mary, her sister Mary did what? Sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught. But Martha, everybody say, but Martha. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing for Jesus and the guest. Because he didn't just come alone, right? He had people with him. She came to Jesus. And what she did, she came to Jesus. Well, forget that. She was distracted. Everybody say distracted. The word distracted, what does that mean? The word distracted means a thing that prevents someone from giving full attention to someone or something else. A thing that prevents someone from giving full attention to someone or someone else. It means extreme agitation of mind or emotions. That you're agitated. Here, here's a cool definition too. It means to draw a line, what? Draw different ways at the same time. It's tough to do. In other words, wherever your focus is, you're getting further and further away, whether it's good things or bad things. Distractions don't have to be good or bad. They're just distractions. And it doesn't matter, uh, you know, whether you're a wife, a mother, a son, or a daughter, or whatever. Distractions is what, what deters you away. So I tell people like this too. What's Satan do to get you to depart the faith? First, he distracts you. And when he distracts you from daddy and gets you focused on other things or other stuff, he distracts you. Then what's he do? He discourage, he'll, Then discouragement comes in. And when discouragement comes in, then we depart the faith. That's the same way that breaks families down. Families come together, it's great, start a family, but something along the way, career, work, hurt, past, or things that are going on, get you agitated, focused on everything other than what you originally started and your focus was, and then discouragement. What's that mean? Discourage. It connects you from the courage you had to do it in the first place. 
and then you depart, you leave that. And a lot of people divorce without ever, without ever, without ever getting divorced. They leave the home without ever leaving the home. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to be physically gone to not be there. You don't have to be physically gone to not be present. And here Martha, good intentions, using her gift. She's doing everything she can, but she is distracted. And then, then look what Jesus said. And she came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to my sister that she just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. Now, isn't it interesting? It's like whenever you get distracted, it makes your judgment wrong. We can't make good decisions when we're distracted. We, we can't make the kind of decisions we need to do. Well, whenever we do that, what happens is now she's judging her sister because her sister isn't doing it the way she does it. She's jealous of her sister because her sister is getting more alone time with the guest, Jesus. You see, she had a different perception of Jesus than what Mary did, obviously. Mary's sitting at his feet getting his teaching. She's not going to miss the moment. What Mary is present. Everybody say present. Like today for Mother's Day, families, be present for your mother. But remember this, we need to be present for our mothers every day because there will be a day she'll be in heaven and you'll wish you had her with you to be present for you. Hmm. Got quiet, Holy Ghost house. Hmm. So distractions are all around you. They're all around us every day. And what happens is distractions take you away from the moment you're in right now. It takes us away from that very moment we're in right now. And like Martha, we get busy even with good things. It doesn't have to be bad things. And what it does, it takes us away from that special moment. And then what did Martha say? She said, Lord, does it seem unfair? Whenever you're distracted, you know what happens? In other words, I don't see God for who he is. I don't see him as daddy. I don't see him as Abba. I don't see him as love or as grace. What happens when you don't have the right perception of God, you, it's impossible to have the right perception of yourself. And if you don't have the right perception of yourself, there's no way that you're going to have the right perception of anyone you know. And you say, well, why do so many people get hurt from the church and don't come back? It's because churches a lot of times don't have the right perception of Jesus. You say, wow, is this one of those churches? This is not the church, Bethel. You're the church. The Bible says that His, your earthen vessels that carry the treasure of God in you. You are the church. You are the body of Christ. And, and, and when somebody gets hurt in the church, it's easy to talk second or third person where they hurt me. Who's they? Well, that church down there. What church? A name? A building? A, a, a real estate? A system? An organization? No. People hurt people. And people that don't have the right perspective of Jesus never can healthily perceive other people to bring healing to their lives. Oh, you can minister to people that are just like you because you what? Understand them. What if somebody comes up and they, your, your wife's talking to the husband and there's this person that needs prayer in a church and she says, well, honey, maybe you should pray with them. They're a little more like you. Or he'll say, honey, maybe you should pray with them. They're a little more like you. You'll un what, if they're like you, what, you understand them more? But Jesus said it's not about understanding them. It's about understanding him so you can understand yourself and then you can relate to anyone. Because he calls you to the uncomfortable places. So we see in, it's interesting in John 11, 5, John 11 is where Lazarus has been dead for three days. Jesus is coming back to raise him from the dead right out of the tomb. And, uh, and as soon as he comes up to the family of Lazarus, he sees Martha and Mary and he addresses Martha first. So it seems to me that Martha must have handled this correction okay when Jesus said you're much too distracted. What happened is she worked on that. She didn't give up her works, her hospitality, her gift set. She just began to know him more what he wants. So then she understood more who she was. Hmm. 
You see, Martha was an amazing person. She's just distracted. She was hurt. Then she felt judged. Isn't it something when the Holy, when Holy Spirit corrects us, sometimes we just feel condemned? Or when a word comes and we know it's true, but it still feels like condemnation. It don't line up with who I am or what I want to be or where I want to go. Or I just want to be miserable. There, there's just people, I'm just telling you, some of you in this room, you just want to be mad. You just want to be miserable. You just want to be broke. You just want to be hated. You just want to be whatever. You, you, you know what you're, the reason is, is because you don't have the proper perspective of Jesus. There's people in here you don't feel you ever get loved enough. You're ever noticed enough. You're ever you're never seen enough. Maybe it's because you don't properly see Jesus the way He sees you. So, in other words, people hurt people. So, if I'm hurting people, that means I'm a hurt person. And if I don't get the healing I need, I'll just keep leaving dead bodies everywhere. I'll just keep leaving hurt people all around me. Martha was like doing this great thing, distracted, and now she had to come to this realization. I love, uh, I love what happens. It says, uh, what, what is the key really to, to know Daddy like we should know him? Well, John 15, 9 tells us in the app. One verse says, he said this, Jesus said, I have loved you just as, everybody would say just as, the Father loved me. You see, he's our example. Jesus said, I won't say anything my father hasn't told me to say. I won't do anything he hasn't sent me to do. And it wasn't popular a lot of times, but he knew the father's heart. He knew the father's heart. Therefore, he could have the heart for anyone because God is the father of all creation. He said, I have loved you just as the father has loved me. Abide in my love. Continue in his love with me. So what's Jesus saying? A lot of times I always read that like abide in me, abide in Jesus. But no, he is love. He is hope. He is grace. He is peace. He is victory. He is joy. He is patience. That's nine fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5. In Galatians 5. So what I want you to realize, guys, is everything we need we always say it's in Jesus, and we got this figure on the wall from the, you know, everybody's grandma, great grandma probably had it when you were growing up with the Last Supper of Jesus and all the. Right? And we got this picture of Jesus. But we don't have a picture of love. Right? We don't have a picture of love. I'm, I'm messing this up, I'm sure, probably driving everybody crazy. We don't have a picture of love. Jesus said, the way you abide in me is abide in my love. Not a Godhead. Not a Lord. Not a Savior. Yes, he is God. Yes, he is Lord. Yes, he is Savior. Yes, he is the King of Kings. But he said, the way you abide in me is through love. But see, I can't know how to love until I'm first, no, I am love. And the fact that I know me better than anyone else, even including my wife, and she knows herself better than me or anyone else, we're probably the closest to knowing each other more than anybody, but we still are humans and we still know things and feel things and sense things that we don't always say. God knows everything. Here's a miracle, and we used to tease about this with Mark, but I'm about to catch up with him now. He just got brave and did it. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10, he knows where I'm going, says that God not only knows you, he knows what? The number of hairs on your head. Dude, that's knowing something. Hebrews 4, he not only knows your heart, but knows what? The very intentions of what? Not what you've done, what you did. No, he, he knows what you even think and you might could someday possibly do. Shh. You go, oh God, he knows that. I'm going to hell. Huh? He loves you anyway. He loves you anyway. No matter what you think, no matter what you've done or what you ever could do, He loves you anyway. Now, that's what love is. I love what Prophet Trout, when he was here, oh man, Prophet Andre was up crazy last week. 
I got back in time to be with him Monday night in the meeting. I just miss it. I love him. Yeah, I, we were online watching. It was amazing. But um, that's what love is, right? So I was going to say something right before I said love. Oh, Prophet Trout. And he gave the best definition I ever heard for submission, and it's such common sense. People say they're submitted. I'm submitted to uh, my employer. I'm submitted to my spouse. I'm submitted to leadership or whatever it is. He said, you, you're never submitted until you submit with something or someone you don't agree with. That's what submission is. Now, if it doesn't line up with the Scripture, run from it. But if it's not anti-Scripture, anti-God, and, and you just don't like the decision, you don't like the way it made you feel or whatever, true submission is when I submit to you and I don't agree. That's what submission is. That's also what love is. It's simply loving you, not the way I think you should be, but just the way you are. And a lot of times loving people is not the problem that I have loving them. My problem is getting them to love themselves and to believe that they are loved just as they are. The Bible says God's what? No respecter of persons. That means me and you. Can you, can you be one? All right, I'm about to wrap up. Let's look at Mary's perspective just for a few minutes. And you see her in verse 39, her sister Mary at the feet of the Lord, listening to what he was teaching, what was taught. <clears throat> at this moment, Martha did not see Jesus as Lord. She just saw her annoying sister getting all the attention. Well, I just, why do those people go up there and dance and raise their hands? Same people every week up there worshiping. I, I, well, maybe there's an invitation for you. There's plenty of room. You know, it's easy for us to look at others when it makes us feel uncomfortable because they're taking a step we don't have the courage to take. And most times it's not that we don't have courage to take, we don't feel worthy enough to take. The reason the altar and the floors aren't full, people in the aisles worshiping every time somebody sings or worship, you know why? It's not that you don't feel, you know, like you're too good for it. You just don't feel good enough. I told you I'm a heavy metal and preacher. I'm heavily metal. And, and that's what we got to realize. If, if I ever find myself apprehensive to worship or to pray, I just jump right in and do it because I know it's something to do with me not feeling worthy enough. And if I sit there and allow it to distract me before long, I'll believe it. Don't believe the lie from Satan. Jesus said in John 10, 10, Satan comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. But what I have come to give life and to give life more abundantly. Martha's perspective was, I'm going to do all this stuff because I'm not good enough to sit around with the men. I mean, there's one thing to sit around at the feet of Jesus, but, but a woman was, definitely wasn't allowed to sit around with men when there was preparation to be done, right? But here she is, a center of attention that could care less, sitting right there, worshiping, listening to what is taught. See, Mary saw something different about Jesus. Simon Peter saw something different about Jesus too, right? In Matthew 16, we talked about it a lot, verses 15 through 17, where Jesus asked him, Simon, who do you say that I am? And he said, you are God, the son, you are the son of God, right? The Christ, the anointed one, which would have been blasphemy to sit there and have that. And then Jesus said, you're right, Simon Barjona. And then what did he do? He named him Simon Peter. Simon, you heard me tell you in the Hebrew, Simon means son, son of, uh, son, Bar means son, Jonah means spirit or dove, son of one who hears the spirit. So what you realize is he was hearing the Spirit even though Peter still messed up. Peter was the hothead. And in that same chapter, tell me this is not love. Gosh, it's killing me. What's it, is it making that noise out there to you all? Is it my jacket? I don't know. Let's try that. No, it's not that. Maybe I'm breathing too hard. I don't know. It's driving me nuts. Maybe I'll loosen it up and see if I can. It's the back. I'm almost over. I'm coming to the big crescendo here. Lord. Okay, fix that back. Oh, I thought you meant fix this back up. 
Here, here's Simon Peter. This is love. Give me another microphone. I'm killing everybody. I'm killing myself. I know I'm killing you all. I, all I hear is. <sighs> Man, I know it's not their fault. There we go. Okay. Is that better? Whew. Helping me. I'm like whew, scratching a chalkboard to myself. But think about this, guys. Simon Peter, just Simon Barjona, just got his name changed to The Rock. Ooh, I love The Rock. Anybody love The Rock? Yeah. If you don't know who I'm talking about, you don't love him. I love him. I love The Rock. Simon Barjona became Simon Peter. The Rock. The pebble that's just like The Rock Jesus. And before the chapter ends, he says to Jesus, is telling him how, you know, I'm going to be crucified. This that. No, you won't. No, you won't. Bless God. Oh, so now you had one revelation. You saw Jesus right for one time in your whole life, and now you you know more than Jesus. I know you don't ever feel like you know more than Jesus. Right? And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. And I bet the other dude said, yeah, I knew Peter would blow it. He didn't make it two hours. He blew it. That's Peter. But love is this, Peter, when you hear the cock crow three times, you will have denied it. No, I won't. Yes, you will. What happened? Third time, he'd already cursed Jesus. He denied him. Peter left the faith. But as soon as Jesus rose from the dead and, and Mary Magdalene and them were outside the, 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 the tomb, what happened? He said, go get my disciples and Peter. See, Peter already marked himself off. Peter was done. He'd already got his fishing boat out and ready to fish. He even talked the other disciples into go fishing with him. And then Jesus shows up after he came back to the Father and waved at him. And when one of them said, that sounds like Jesus' voice, Peter jumped in in his underwear and just started running to the water to Jesus. Why? Because he was the one forgiven of the most. It wasn't John, the one who loved Jesus and hung at Jesus. He was, he was the, the male Mary, right? He was just loved Jesus, and he had the heart of Jesus. Peter, up, down, all around, but what did he do? He was running on water, man. Why? Because he'd been forgiven of much. So what if you turned it around and say, I've been a mess? Then that means it takes a greater blessing for God to turn my life around. That means I'm even greatly blessed. That means you're blessed more than someone else but it can get you on the same page of the way God sees you. Everybody say the way God sees me. Let me wrap this up. So what happens is when we don't see Jesus correctly, it mars our vision of him, mars our vision. The word mar, whatever, the word mar means distract from perfection or wholeness. In other words, to distract us from completeness. Perfection is not, I do everything right. Perfection is not, I never sin, I never make a mistake. No, perfection means completeness. And what Jesus is saying, what he's saying here is to be marred, distraction, what keeps you from completion. So if, if I'm always in touch with Jesus and I can take it to him even when I blow it, even when I mess up, and come to him as his child, what happens is he can replenish me and he can complete me, right? There's times I, I leak out, right? And I need Jesus to just complete me again, right? Just, just, just to fill me again, just to be there with me again. You see, it's the distractions that keep us from completion. It's the debt. It's the business decisions. It's, it's the relationship decisions. It's, it's the failures. It's the addictions. All, these things, to God, they're nothing, but you're everything. And what breaks his heart, not that you blew it and you sinned, what breaks his heart is that you're running from him. He's saying, just come to me. You burden, you heavy laden. I'm here for you. I'm saying yesterday, today, and forever. He is God and changes not. Then what Jesus said in the final two verses. But the Lord said to her, to Martha, right? My dear Martha, 
You were worried and upset over all these details. To him, it's just details. See, even God spoke like a man, son, right? <laughs> details, details. That's what he said. Verse 42, when we're in trouble, honey, that's just the details, right? We missed it, but we're not going to let anybody know. Verse 42, there's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from you. You see, Martha was preoccupied with things, with stuff, with agendas, her to-do list, but Mary was preoccupied with Jesus. And what happens is when you're so focused on everything you're doing, you're serving, you're working at, you're going to leak. But if you want to be refilled, then that means you've got to get back at the feet of Jesus like Mary. She served him with her worship. She served him with her prayer, her adoration, and her presence. A devoted heart only sees the immediate needs, doesn't only see the immediate needs, but looks ahead to the benefits of God's presence. When you're devoted to God, when, when you're willing to sit at his feet, I got it. My girl over there, I got, just so y'all know, I got five minutes. Actually, I got four because you held it for a minute. I didn't, I didn't want you to know. I kept looking out of the corner of my eye. I like messing with you. Tell you what, I know who runs that family, Paul. It ain't mama either, right? She's, she's a who. She's been doing that so long. She she lines past. She, she controls pastor more than about anybody, I think. But the way you come to Jesus' feet, we say sacrifice. Okay, what do you want me to do? Kind of like Nahum, right? The great warrior king, whenever he needed to be healed of leprosy, and he told the prophet, just, I'll go fight a war. I'll go kill a nation. What do you need? Now, go in that old muddy, sewer-fested river over there and dump yourself seven times. What? I'm, I'm a king. But you know what? He was dying, and he did it, didn't he? And on the seventh time, he was like a new baby skin. See, we don't always know the prescription of what it takes to fix us. To fix our marriage, to fix our kids, to fix our family, to fix ourselves. But he does. And it may not always be what you want to hear or what you always want to see, but he knows the truth. Sacrifice is not doing. Sacrifice is humbling ourselves to receive. Sacrifice is not a work, it's a posture. You ever feel like you want to sacrifice and help someone, you just lay your agenda aside, and maybe it's out of your spectrum, but you know, you're know you qualified, highly in another area, very successful, but you're over here trying to you know, go out with Miss Pat and cut the weeds and run a tractor, and you've never, but you're some corporate executive. You know, that's sacrifice, because I, I'm sacrificing, humbling myself to serve God at whatever I got to do, Versus what I think I should do. I should run the day because I'm corporate. I know how everything should run. Well, maybe you need to want to go pick up trash. And I'm not putting anybody down for success. I believe in success. I'm using this as an illustration that we never, ever, ever get above sacrifice. And then the other part that I told them, well, I guess I'll go pick up the trash. That's all I ever do in life anyway. That's the other side of the coin. I'll just sacrifice for the Lord and be broke all my life. Well, you probably don't tithe. And I don't know how much you work. You don't have to be broke and poor. That doesn't mean you're not broke and poor right now. But if you start sacrificing and stay at the feet of Jesus and just obey him and do your best, favor will find you. Blessing will find you. The Bible says blessing won't only find you. Blessing will overtake you. You won't be overtaken with, taken with poverty. You'll be overtaken with blessing. Now he's preaching get rich. That's why you'll never be. Because you can't humble yourself enough to receive. I'm going to pray right after this, but i got to say this. I grew up in eastern Kentucky, right? And we were poor when my dad, after my dad died. He had like three jobs, railroad, was a constable, a bunch of other stuff. But once he died, there was no welfare back then. I'm that old. It's before government assistance. My mom had a house full of kids, eighth grade education. She just had to go out and work in restaurants because she knew how to cook. She worked three shifts. She'd start breakfast, stay for lunch, and work all the way to closing for years. And then one day, this little lady, Miss Buskirk, owned this little restaurant down in Inez. She said, Ruby, I'm tired. I'm old. Oh, Miss Buskirk, you're fine. No, I'm going to sell this place. Mom's like, well, you 
think they'll keep me on, Miss Buskirk? said, no, they probably won't. Mom's about to cry. They probably won't. What do you mean they won't? Because you're going to be the one that has this restaurant. And she's like, I can't buy this restaurant. Yeah, you can. I'm going to make sure you can. And she worked it out for Mom to buy that restaurant. And before long, we were living in the back of the restaurant. But favor found her. Favor found her. I don't know what you need favor in. Maybe it's health. Maybe it's finances. Maybe it's relationships. Maybe it's just peace. But God's favor has found you today.